Hi everybody. On 15th of August 2014, the government of India made a revolutionary announcement about the Pradhan Mantri Jan Dhan Yojana, and this gave rise to an iconic venture by the National Payment Corporation of India. This venture that I'm talking about is none other than India's own card network that we all know today as Rupee. And Rupee has taken such big strides in the Indian payment industry that in 2013, Rupee accounted for only 0.6% of all cards. But in just four years, by 2017, Rupee had already surpassed Visa as India's largest payment card with 375 million transactions. And by 2020, it already commanded a market share of 60% in India's card market. And this put Visa under such big threat that it approached the U.S. government to help them stand against Rupee. So the question is: In just six years, how did Rupee kill the billion-dollar duopoly of Visa and Mastercard in India? What is the government's strategy and intent behind this revolutionary initiative? And most importantly, as citizens of India, what is it that we need to know about Rupee as to how is it going to affect the lives of the people of India? This video is brought to you by thefixedincome.com. But more on this at the end of the video. The first thing you need to understand is how does the payment ecosystem operate in order to carry out our transactions. So let's try to understand this with very simple examples. Let's say I have an HDFC Visa card with a one lakh rupees of credit limit, and Alan Polly is this clothing merchant with her account in ICICI. This makes HDFC the issuing bank and ICICI the acquiring bank, and this is how the transaction between us gets executed in the back end. When I enter my HDFC card details to make a ten thousand rupees payment, my card details get entered into the payment gateway of the website, which in this case, let's say, is Razorpay. Here, the value add of Razorpay is that it will help the merchant receive payments from different sources like credit card, debit card, UPI, etc. Now, since I am making a credit card transaction, Razorpay will collect my card information and the transaction amount, and then it will pass it on to the merchant's bank, which in this case is ICICI. From then onwards, ICICI will capture the transaction and forward the information to my credit card network, which in this case is Visa. This is where Visa routes the transaction to my bank, which is HDFC, and requests for an approval. So basically, Visa is asking HDFC system whether I have enough funds and what is the status of my account. So let's say my card is blocked, then this transaction will be declined. If I do not have enough credit limit, then this transaction will be declined. Similarly, in case of a debit card, if I do not have enough balance, then my card will be declined. And if everything is all right, and if I have the required credit limit, then the transaction is authorized. This approval process is known as authorization. After that, HDFC sends the response back to Visa, wherein HDFC says everything is perfect and assigns and transmits an authorization code along with its response. And this way. Ten thousand rupees is put on hold from my HDFC account. Then Visa sends this approval to the merchant's payment processor, which in this case is Razorpay, and Razorpay then sends the approval to the acquiring bank, that is ICICI. ICICI then routes the approval code to the merchant's terminal, and depending on the merchant or the transaction type, the merchant's terminal will print a receipt for the customer to sign. So if it's a website, you will see a digital receipt. If it's a swipe machine, you will get the receipt printed. This is how the transaction is processed. Now we come to the business part of this process. To carry out this transaction, the issuing bank or the customer's bank and the credit card network charge their fees, which together accounts for three percent, which is three hundred rupees. This percentage could range anywhere between one percent to three percent. In this case, considering three percent fees on ten thousand rupees, three hundred rupees is deducted and nine thousand seven hundred rupees is transferred to the merchant's account. Now this transaction fees of 300 rupees is known as MDR or merchant discount rate. Apart from that, Razorpay will levy a charge of 0.5 percent, which will eventually give the merchant 9,650 rupees. This is how the payment ecosystem works together to process our day-to-day -day transaction. It's just that for debit cards there are two simple differences. Instead of the credit limit, the amount gets deducted directly from the bank account, so the repayment process is eliminated. And secondly. The MDR for credit card is way more than the debit cards. So while debit card MDRs are capped at 0.9 percent, for credit cards the MDR is typically 1 to 3 percent. Now listen to this very very carefully. Now this MDR rate majorly includes two variables. The first variable is something called the interchange fee, and the second is something called the switching fee. Now I know that this is information overload, but don't worry, it's very very simple to understand. The interchange fee is the fee that the issuing bank charges the acquiring bank, as in the customer's bank charges the merchant's bank, which in this case HDFC is charging ICICI Bank. 
and then the switching fee is charged by the card network to the issuing bank. In this case, it's Visa charging the customer's bank, which is HDFC. And up until 2014, Visa and Mastercard together were two of the most powerful players who had established almost a duopoly in the card network market of India. But this is where something crazy happened. This is where the government of India came up with a disruption using its very own card network, which is known as Rupay. On 15th of August 2014, the Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana was announced, and this initiative mandated banks to enable zero balance accounts with deposit insurance and overdraft facility for the unbanked population of India. So from 2014 onwards, millions of bank accounts started opening up all across the country. By January 2015, this number grew to 125 million, and by January 2021, this number stood at 416.5 million bank accounts, with women in rural areas accounting for more than half of this number. And this is where, ladies and gentlemen, Rupay came in. In order to make card transactions accessible to the lowest economic strata of India, instead of leaving a percentage charge like Visa and Mastercard, for Rupay, a fixed MDR of just 90 paise was charged, which was 60 paise to the issuer bank and 30 paise to the acquiring bank. And according to the chief executive and managing director of NCPI, Mr. AP Hota, this was a key differentiating factor that led to the enormous success of Rupay. And what followed next was nothing short of revolutionary. All Indian companies with an annual turnover exceeding 50 crores were required to offer Rupay payment options to their customers. And according to a data by the Department of Financial Services under the Ministry of Finance, 31.74 crore Rupay debit cards have been issued until now. And in just 6 to 7 years, the market share of Rupay shot up to 34.5% out of the 90 crore debit cards issued in India. But you know what? Then came another big announcement by the government of India, wherein it was eventually declared that there will be zero merchant discount rate for Rupay debit cards. And this put Visa in such deep trouble that now it is seeking the help of the US government itself. Now the question over here is, how and why did the business war between Visa and Rupay come in? And why did the government of India introduce the concept of zero MDR? Well, the answer to this lies in the fundamental problems existing in the Indian banking ecosystem. And here are the most important ones that prompted the government of India to launch Rupay. If you go 11 years back in 2011, back then close to 557 million people, which is close to 50% of India's population did not even have a bank account. This was majorly because the banks demanded a minimum balance of 3 to 5,000 rupees from their customers. Now this may seem relatively fair to us, but for people like daily wage laborers, the contract laborers or our maids, this sum of money is their rental cost and the grocery budget for an entire month. Therefore, most people in the unorganized sector, like our Chaiwala and Bheburiwaras, they refrain from opening bank accounts. This meant that 557 million people were bereft of any financial support and facilities. And even if the government wanted to provide support, if 50% of your population, that to the bottom of the pyramid is excluded from the banking system, then it is nothing short of a disaster. This is the reason why the government of India introduced the Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana and made sure that every citizen in India can be banked without having a minimum balance barrier. And what was mind-blowing to most analysts was that the total estimated balance held in these accounts was estimated at 1,37,195.93 crore rupees, which is equivalent to 18 billion dollars. But this is where the government discovered a critical challenge. You see, when we open a new bank account, we get a checkbook and a debit card as a part of the account opening process. This debit card is crucial because it facilitates withdrawals from ATMs and enables us to make cashless transactions. And because of this, there was a dire need to have Visa and MasterCard like services. But this is where the government discovered three critical challenges. Number one, back then, Mastercard and Visa had their offerings only with 55 banks out of the 500 plus banks that existed in India. And they were predominantly catering to the private sector banks. So there was a dire need of a card network that could serve the rest of the 500 banks in India. Number two, offering debit and credit to the unbanked required customizations like giving credit lines to farmers or helping them procure grains and these facilities did not come under the ambit of players like MasterCard and Visa at all. And thirdly, the processing cost of these international players was very, very high. So while big merchants like Zara or McDonald's have the luxury of having a 40, 50, sometimes even 90% profit margins, when it comes to small scale vendors like a grocery store or an electrical store, their profit margins are ranging between 10 to 30%. And in that case, if you charge an MDR of one to 3%, it goes very heavy on their profits. This is the reason why zero MDR was introduced through Rupay. But now the question over here is, 
Are the banks incurring losses because now that MDR is zero, both interchange fee and switching fee has to be zero, right? So the question is, how is this even viable for the banks? Well, for starters, for the losses incurred due to the charges like the interchange fee, wherein the acquiring bank pays the issuing bank to compensate for these type of fees, the government has set aside 1300 crores to make sure that the stakeholders in the ecosystem are compensated for their losses. This is how the government is on a cash drain to make sure that the bottom of the pyramid of India is included in the banking systems of India. Now the question is, what is the benefit of spending 1300 crores into making a payment service free? Isn't that a reckless use of the tax based money? So the question is, why is the government spending so much money after all for a card network and how can it change the lives of the ordinary people of India? The first thing this move has done is lay the foundation for financial inclusion such that it gives the government a pipeline to distribute schemes and services to the people of India. Secondly, India can and is providing facilities to those segments of the population which will otherwise never be catered to by a company like Visa or Mastercard. And Rupee has already started doing that by the way with its 5 types of cards. These card types includes a PMJDY debit card which comes with a added personal accident death and total disability coverage up to 2 lakh rupees. The Mudra card which can be used to make multiple withdrawals and avail credits to manage the working capital limit in an efficient and productive manner. The Pun Grain card that can be used to avail automatic grain procurement facilities at the Pun Grain Mondays. And lastly, we have the Kisan credit card scheme which was implemented to provide need-based timely credit to support farmers for their cultivation needs as well as for their non-farming activities in a cost-efficient manner. This can help India take financial inclusion to the next level and can empower the common people of India if executed with persistence and consistency. And lastly, just like Visa and Mastercard being foreign entities became dominating forces in the Indian ecosystem, Rupee and UPI both are now venturing into the foreign soil with the vision to revolutionize payment industry not just in India but the world itself. Now what remains to be seen is how do we build up from here because in case of BSNL and Air India both we saw that it's quite evident being the best and having the government's back alone cannot help you if you succumb to the challenges of capitalism. And this brings me to the most important part of the episode and those are the study materials and the references to help you ponder over this concept and to help you understand the government initiatives better. Before we move on, I have an important announcement from our partners TheFixedIncome.com for those who are looking to make healthy and fixed returns on their investments. You see, Visa is in deep deep trouble but your portfolio doesn't have to be. If you had all of your money in the stock market, last month was a bad month for you, isn't it? Which is why they say it is important to diversify your portfolio. And right now it's a great time because there are a lot of new opportunities that are coming up for investors like you and me. And one such opportunity is brought to you by TheFixedIncome.com. TheFixedIncome.com allows you to invest in various types of high quality bonds like bank bonds, PSU bonds, tax free bonds, sovereign bonds, gold bonds and many other types of bonds that can give you a fixed income after maturity. And not just that, you can even apply in bond IPOs using this app. You can start investing in bonds starting as low as 10,000 rupees and can get a guaranteed return on your investments. So if you want to make low risk fixed return giving investments, download the app from the link in the description. Moving on, there are three things that I want you to think and read about to understand the government strategy with both Rupee and UPI. Number one, check out the website of Rupee and see how is it operating and study how Rupee and UPI are being leveraged for financial inclusion in India. And more importantly, study the importance of financial inclusion and its impact on a country's economy. Secondly, do study how this move could go wrong. In my sight, it could play out in two ways. Number one, if this initiative is not executed properly, then the 1300 crore wala number, which is only going to keep going up, will be nothing but a meaningless drain of cash. Number two, since there are many stakeholders involved in the payment ecosystem, until a certain point subsidizing makes sense. But if it starts eating into the profits of the players like the payment gateways and the banks, then the incentive that these entities have in order to spread digital payments will fade away and this will be nothing short of a socialistic nightmare. How and why I want you to tell me in the comment section. And if not, just read through what others have to say. And lastly, I am attaching a few articles to help you get a deeper understanding of this subject. So go through them and do let me know what you think about in the comment section. That's all from my side for today guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button in order to make YouTube Baba happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.